Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship Shakespeare Authorship Symposium. Either good afternoon or good evening to you wherever you are tonight in the world watching us, whether it's across the country or across the globe. We're so glad to have you and we're so glad to have you welcome us into your living room, your office, or wherever you're streaming us right at this minute. We have a great program established for you over the next two days. This evening we'll be broadcasting until 6 p.m. Pacific Time, and tomorrow we will begin at 9 a.m. Pacific Time and broadcast through the day until 5 p.m. with a great lineup that we will share with you later on this evening. Before we get into our full presentation, I'd like to tell you who I am. My name is Stephen Sable, and I will be your master of ceremonies throughout the next two days of this symposium. I am a former producer and director of a theater company in Burbank, California. I now live in wonderful Southern Oregon. But we're coming to you live today from Napa, California and the August Family Vineyards, a beautiful location as you can see behind me as well, a, a wonderful estate. And we're so pleased to be able to use this studio today to bring you this wonderful symposium and a full schedule of programs that we think will not only intrigue you, but also will have you asking lots of questions. If you'd like to join us, you can. You can throw a chat into the chat and engage with the program regularly. Please go ahead and share with your friends and family that this symposium is absolutely free and that they too, whether they have registered ahead of time or not, can go to the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship YouTube channel and join you in viewing. Before we move forward, I'd like to introduce you to our host for the weekend. He is Ben August. He is a member of the Board of Trustees of the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship. And this is his beautiful home and estate where he has invited us to broadcast live to you here in Napa. Ben, please come over. Ladies and gentlemen, Ben August. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks for uh, having me here. It's a pleasure to have everybody in our home, uh, either in with some friends here live and of course, uh, many of you virtually as well. So uh, I look forward to a great program. You guys always do it, the great the talks that we see every year. And it's, it's nice that we can share that with everybody uh, online here tonight. You know, Ben, one of the things that I love about arriving here yesterday to get things ready and get our studio set up here in your wonderful living room was looking at the vineyards that you have here on the estate. And many people don't know, you actually are a winemaker as well. And could you share with us a little bit, because there's something really special about your wine and your label. Could you share that with people who are viewing? Well, we make a uh, Sauvignon Blanc, a Merlot, and a Cabernet. And uh, the name on the label is Earl 17, uh, after the Earl of Oxford. Yes, we have We actually here. happen to have a <laughs> bottle right here, how perfectly placed. And uh, there he is, the Earl of Oxford right there on the label. Yes, that's the bronze statue that was sculpted by Paulus Slater. And so beautifully, we have an original here uh, in, in our home and uh, very proud to spread the word via my favorite beverage. <laughs> and Edward Devere is looking over us right here from the mantle as well, a, a miniature version of that same bust. And we're glad that he could join us for this wonderful symposium. Thank you so much for having us, Ben, and we look forward to having a great weekend here. My pleasure. Thank you. <clears throat> we hope that you do have plans to join us not only through this evening, like I said, we'll be broadcasting live this evening until 6 p.m., but also all day tomorrow. You're not compelled to be there all day, but I guarantee you that you'll want to be. We will take a lunch break between noon and 1 p.m., so make sure that you're aware of that. Everybody has to eat, don't they? But we will begin at 9 a.m. tomorrow and go all the way through 5 p.m. So make sure you erase anything else you have on your schedule and get your snacks and favorite libations ready. Maybe it's a bottle of Earl 17 wine. Now I'd like to introduce you to the president of the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship. His name is John Hamill, and he's here tonight to explain to you some of the wonderful themes and reasons why this symposium is happening and why we're dedicating this symposium to ve two very special themes. John, welcome. Thank you, Stephen. So we can't shake hands. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm just very pleased and proud to be here today and thank Ben August for hosting this event because, as you know, this is a condensed version of our annual conference. We have never done this before. This is a new experiment and uh, it's going to be live streamed instead of, instead of live in person. So instead of being a four days, this is a two day event, actually a day and a half event. 
So uh, again, we changed everything. And last week, hopefully many of you were at the annual meeting for the members. That was only for the members. And that was, it seemed to work okay. We had a few glitches, but it worked okay. And this year, again, we separated the annual meeting from the, from the conference, so that's what we're calling this a symposium. So because it's a, it's a day and a half symposium to do this. So again, I want to thank uh, Ben for this. And this is a, a very interesting time to be here because we, as you know, Napa is under forest fires. We have lots of wines burned, some of the office, I mean, some of the wineries have been burnt. We have a lot of smoke. That's why we're inside. It's smoky outside, and it's also hot. Uh, now, the glass fire, as you probably heard the news, started about five days ago and destroyed thousands of acres down here. But luckily, I guess we're safe in, this, in Ben's house. And uh, like, like Stephen said, Ben is a member of the Board of Trustees. And he makes his own wine. That's why we made him be a member of the board. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm delighted to have, uh, we think around, around 300, over 300 people who signed up for the, for the symposium. So I hope most of you can, can attend. And uh, I, like Stephen said, we're dedicating this, this symposium to two events. First is for ben, Tom Bregnias. Uh, he passed away. He used to be the president of the SOF for four years. And yesterday would have been Tom's 70th birthday. So it's very timely that this weekend we can dedicate this, event, this symposium to Tom. In addition, this year, 2020, is the 100th anniversary of J. Thomas Looney's Shakespeare identified. And uh, we had an event in March of this year at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. And Tom Bernier spoke at that event, among other, uh, among other exponents. So luckily, that was, the event was taped. And so we have Tom's last talk before he passed away from the National Press Club. And I was lucky enough to spend most of that day with him and had dinner with him. And then he took a taxi to the airport, and within weeks he was gone. But that was the last time I saw him, last time most of us saw him. So again, this again, this whole symposium is a memory of, of him. Uh, so those are the main points I had. Later on, we'll be talking about money and donations, but we'll go into, into that in a little while. In the meantime, uh, we have some brochures about the organization, Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship, that if you request, we can mail you a copy. And, uh, and the last, actually, that will be in, in the copy. That copy will be for the members in the next newsletter. If, every newsletter will have a copy of this brochure about the about uh, Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship. Last, if, last brochure, we talked about the hundredth anniversary of of, of, uh, of Looney's book Shakespeare Identified, and so that that was a brochure in the, in the last newsletter also. This brochure ran out so if you want to get a copy actually I found like a couple like I, I like 10 that I can mail out to people who need it and in the meantime we will be reissuing the brochure we'll be updating the brochure to add the bust that we see behind us in the brochure of Oxford that Ben has and then later on we'll be talking about ensuring the future of the SOF uh, through through living legacy so anyway we'll talk about that later on uh, and during today and tomorrow about how to, you can donate. And there's a brochure for this too that we can also mail to you. So those, oh, I hope, one last thing, one last thing. Uh, I don't know if you can see this, how well you can see this. The Declaration of Reasonable Doubt by John Shahan. It's about signing, uh, hopefully most of you know this and have signed it. And uh, it's online at doubt, it's at, it's at, uh, Doubtaboutwill. Will. Doubtaboutwill.org. That's right. I know that one. <laughs> so if you don't have it, you can doubtaboutwill.org. Go on your website, look it up, and you will um, sign it because we're trying to get like 5,000 people to sign it uh, by the end of this year. So uh, this tells people that we exist. It's important. A lot of people are aware of this issue. And the point of this issue is that this is... The Shakespeare authorship question is a real issue, needs to be addressed in academia and the media, 
and right now we're just being ignored. And this is a way of letting people know that we are interested in this issue be discussed. That's what we call Well, it. actually, right now, John, we're not being ignored. We have hundreds <laughs> of viewers watching this symposium. Yes. yes and we're glad are. that we're able to offer you this symposium over the next two days to bring this issue to the forefront for you and for those that you have helped introduce to this issue. We have a great program lined up, and John will be back later on to talk to us a little bit more, Thank like he Steve. said, about the future of the Shakespeare Thank Oxford Fellowship. The Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship is more than 60 years old, and, a, and it is a strong organization that has been growing year after year. This year, we've gained nearly 100 new members already, and if you haven't already joined, you can join at our website, which you can see at the bottom of your screen, shakespeareoxfordfellowship.org. Membership is very inexpensive, and all the benefits of membership are listed there at the website. You can also go to the website, if you haven't already, to receive a program and view a schedule of this weekend's events, including our featured speaker this evening, Dr. Earl Showerman, and our featured speakers for tomorrow, which we will review later on this evening to go over what tomorrow's schedule is. We want you to also remember that the Shakespeare authorship question is centuries, year, centuries old. It didn't just begin with J. Thomas Loney 100 years ago, but even at the, during the time that the Shakespearean works were being written, there were quite a number of people at that time who made allusions to the fact that the works were being written under a pseudonym or by someone in disguise. If you'd like to know more about that, one of our programs tomorrow is going to touch on that, and there also is a lot of information on the website as well. Don't forget that ShakespeareOxfordFellowship.org is your source and resource for everything Shakespeare authorship question. Right now, we'd like to introduce to you who is going to be our featured speaker this evening. He won't be giving his presentation yet. You'll have to stay tuned for that. But Dr. Earl Shoreman is here, and he wants to talk to you a little bit about the importance of what a symposium is. As John mentioned, the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship has a annual conference every year. This year, it was scheduled to be held in Ashland, Oregon. Unfortunately, as we all know, under the circumstances of this strange year that we're in, in 2020, that conference had to be canceled. And this symposium became our substitute. We're so glad that you could all join us. As it turns out, the symposium has been uh, had a side benefit in that there are hundreds more of you viewing us right now than could have possibly fit into a lecture room at the Ashland Hotel where we were scheduled to be. We're hoping that we can return to Ashland next fall. But in the meantime, we have this great symposium lined up to touch on the things that we normally would touch on every year as an organization. One of those key things is the newest revelations and the newest research that we as an organization and our scholar members have come upon over our last year of scholarship. Don't forget, this weekend we're also going to be announcing our annual Oxfordian of the Year Award and also the winners of our Who Wrote Shakespeare video contest, which now in its fourth year is becoming one of our greatest outreach efforts that the organization has embarked upon. <clears throat> one of our other great outreach efforts we want to share with you is our wonderful podcast series. Yes, I know, I'm biased. I admit it right away. If you haven't tuned into our podcast series, Don't Quill the Messenger, please do. You can find that at dragonwagonradio.com or you can find links on our website. We have more than 40 episodes recorded now and new episodes coming out every two weeks. So if you haven't already downloaded and streamed some of those episodes, please do. And we'd love to get your comments. Send us an email. Most of you who are viewing, if you have listened to the podcast, then you know that I am the host of the series. And I'm so glad to have you listening every other week, week after week with us. Tomorrow, as part of the program, you'll get to watch an episode of the podcast be broadcast live to you as Dr. Showerman, who is one of our most featured guests, returns for another episode of Don't Quill the Messenger. And here he is to tell you a little bit about what a symposium really is. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stephen. Great pleasure to be here, friends. Um, you know, a year ago, we were thinking that we would all be gathering in Ashland, Oregon, home of the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, the wonderful Tony Award-winning Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Um, and I think that we have succeeded 
Thank you very much, Stephen, for proposing that we put this symposium together, and thank all the faculty who have volunteered to be speaking over this next few days here. Uh, in the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, we've had three previous successful conferences in 2005, 2010, and 2015. In 2010, we had a Declaration of Reasonable Doubt signing ceremony uh, that included Paul Nicholson, the executive director of the Oregon Shakespeare Festival uh, emeritus, and several actors from the company at that time, and others who were involved in the theater culture. So uh, we, we firmly believe that that, uh, that that particular document provides a lot of the important information that would be useful uh, to anybody who wants to raise questions about who actually thought there was a problem with the attribution of the works of Shakespeare and who was really, you know, historically concerned and interested in this. And I'll be talking a little bit about that at the end of my talk on Shakespeare and politics. So in lieu of the conference, we have the symposium. Now I wanted to review a little bit about the meaning of the word symposium itself in relationship to the symposium, one of Plato's most important and uh, memorable dialogues. And I want to remind our readers that the Earl of Oxford purchased a Plato in folio when he was 19 years old, along with his Geneva Bible, uh, Friar Amiot's translation of Plutarch's Lives, both very important Shakespeare sources, and a Chaucer. So at one time he achieved, uh, he, he, at the age of 19, he received all these books. And you can imagine how delighted the Earl of Oxford would have been in reading the symposium, because it's actually more like a drama than it is like a typical platonic dialogue. Uh, it, it, it involves a festival, and there was certainly plenty of wine drunk during that. It was an all-night party, uh, <laughs> related by one of the guests, Aristodemus, who was Socrates' personal guest that came uh, to the symposium. The other guests include the famous comic playwright Aristophanes, and I'll be talking a little bit about him later on in the program, uh, the uh, tra tragedian Agathon, who had won the trilogies competition that year and therefore was throwing the party, uh, and... Uh, Alcibiades, a very, very famous and rather mm, renowned Greek general uh, who eventually betrayed the Athenians and joined the Spartans during the Peloponnesian War, and then he came back and helped rescue Athens briefly. And he's one of the few sympathetic characters actually portrayed in Timon of Athens, in Shakespeare's Timon of Athens. So it was an all-star cast at the symposium, and the theme of it was uh, uh, encomiums uh, on the theme of love. So each of the guests, invited guests, gave a speech about their, their concept of what, is, what comprises love. What, is, what are the manifestations of love in our culture and why is it so important? And uh, Phaedrus, who was the first to speak, actually mentions, among other characters that were exemplars of love, the uh, Queen Alcestis. And Queen Alcestis was the queen of, uh, that was portrayed in Euripides' drama, The Alcestis, who sacrificed her life to save her husband from dying. And uh, so it's an early reference to what would become one of Shakespeare's sources for the final scenes of both The Winter's Tale and Much Ado About Nothing. So there are many literary references within the symposium itself that actually uh, uh, may have been rather significant in terms of the Earl of Oxford's orientation and his interest in Greek literature. Well, we know he, he had a Herodotus. And of course, the Plutarch and other Greek texts were also available to him. He grew up in a household where there were Greek translators, his mother-in-law, Mildred Cecil, with a renowned Greek translator, his tutor, Thomas Smith, also a renowned uh, Greek scholar who put on the plays of Aristophanes at Cambridge in the 1530s and 40s. So he was surrounded by people who were familiar with the Greek canon and, and loved that. But the symposium would have been particularly interesting to him because in the final lines of the symposium, Socrates, everybody else has passed out or gone home. He's giving a little discourse to Aristophanes and Agathon, the comic playwright and the tragic playwright. And he says, you know, a great playwright should be able to write both comedies and tragedies. And so I think the young Earl of Oxford read that and thought, hmm, makes sense to me. Maybe I should try that. So there he goes. So that is the orient orientation that I want you to have, that this is a symposium. We're not drinking wine quite yet. Later on this evening, we'll probably have some, and I hope you are prepared and have your own bottles ready for you. But I wanted to let you know that there is, there is reason to think that the actual word symposium has some significance in this regard. Um, and so I, I'm happy to, to uh, talk more about the Greek sources in Shakespeare, but we're going to have to get into Shakespeare and politics at some point pretty soon here. But I wanted to show you an image from the Oregon Shakespeare Festival's Elizabethan Theater here, which, of course, regrettably, the season, the season was rained out. But we've had such great experiences in Ashland over the years that I want you all to know that we have reserved 
uh, the hotel for both 2021 and 2022, whichever year comes next, that will allow us to have a, a conference with plays and production. And I think that will, that will interest all of you who are anywhere able to come to the West Coast and enjoy that with us. We've had wonderful experiences there in the past and uh, had uh, uh, a great turnouts on each of those occasions. So now, this is an image of the symposium. That's obviously a wine drinking party. And uh, it's, it's really a, a worth, worthy read, I think, that most of you would probably enjoy very, very much. So I want to launch now. I'm a little premature here a few minutes early. I'll take the extra time if you don't no, mind, well, friends. Well, the problem, Earl, is we don't want to, oh. we don't want to start too early. How because, impolitic of me. Well, the thing is... <laughs> You may have people who are going to tune in right at the start of your presentation no. at 4.30. So we want to make sure that they don't get to miss any of the very beginning okay. and intro. So we have about nine minutes left before we get to Dr. Earl Shoreman and Shakespeare in Politics, 16th century to 21st century. So stay tuned for that. We'll be right back with that. Thanks, Earl. Thank you, Stephen.
Welcome back. We're glad that you could be with us. And again, if you're just tuning in now, this is the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship Shakespeare Authorship Symposium coming to you live from the August Family Vineyards and Estate in Napa, California. We're glad that we can have you with us today and we're glad to be wherever you are watching us across the country or around the globe. It's my pleasure to introduce you to tonight's speaker and presentation. He is Dr. Earl Showerman. He graduated from Harvard College and the University of Michigan Medical School and practiced emergency medicine in the state of Oregon for more than 30 years, where he has been a longtime patron of the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. After retiring from medicine in 2003, Earl enrolled at Southern Oregon University to study Shakespeare, and he began his research in the authorship question. Over more than a decade now, Earl has presented a series of papers at conferences for the, for the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship and other prestigious organizations. He's been published on the topic of Shakespeare's Greek dramatic sources and also his remarkable medical acumen. Who better to tell you about what an expert Shakespeare was in medicine than an actual doctor? Earl contributed the chapter in Shakespeare's medical knowledge in Shakespeare Beyond Doubt, question mark, exposing an industry in denial, as well as several topics in Know-It-All Shakespeare. And if you don't have a copy of that, you can find it on Amazon. He is an associate of the Shakespearean Authorship Trust of London and a past president of the Shakespeare Fellowship. And today he's going to present to you Shakespeare and Politics, 16th to 21st centuries. My pleasure to welcome to you Dr. Earl Showerman, MD. Thank you very much again, Stephen. Well, it's a political season, isn't it? Uh, presidential campaigns are going on and other elections. So I thought it would be a good topic for us to share today a little bit about how politicians have responded to Shakespeare and how Shakespeare wrote about politicians. It's a two-way street. Uh, I think it's actually quite a fascinating subject and uh, worthy of our investigation. Now, there are some books I would recommend that are part of this uh, uh, analysis that I want to share with you. The first one is written by Stephen, <laughs> no, this is, this is from James Shapiro, excuse me. Shakespeare in a Divided America, What His Plays Tell Us About Our Past and Our Future. It's qu quite an interesting volume. He uh, takes different uh, uh, periods of time, including uh, a, a long chapter on John Quincy Adams and, and Quincy Adams' relationship with Shakespeare. Uh, he, he covers the Astor Place riots uh, in New York in uh, 1849. Uh, there was a production of Macbeth that was uh, starring William McCready, the famous English actor, and Edwin Forrest, the famous American actor who, who had a bone to pick with McCready, uh, was uh, responsible in some way for fomenting uh, a, a, a demonstration. Between 10 and 25,000 people were outside the Astor Place rioting during that uh, production of Macbeth. And the uh, people who were involved in uh, controlling it, the New York militia came out and began firing into the crowd. 20 people were killed and 100 wounded in that Shakespeare-related uh, riot. Uh, that's one of the topics that he covers in here. And he covers, uh, among other things, Oscar Eustace's uh, public theater production of Julius Caesar, which we'll be talking more about as time goes on. The other book I want to share with you uh, also is uh, Stephen Greenblatt's book. Okay, so two, two of the most popular Shakespeare authors have published books in the last few years. Shapiro's book was 2020, this, this year. And Tyrant, Shakespeare on Politics with Stephen Greenblatt was published in 2018 in the wake of the election of um, our 45th president. Uh, How Shakespeare Put Politics on the Stage, Power and Succession in the History Plays, a 500-page tome by Peter Lake. We'll be talking a little bit about Lake's observations also during this. Uh, previous authors include John Palmer on political Shakespeare uh, characters, uh, let's see, comic and tragic characters and political characters in Shakespeare, and uh, David Bevington's uh, book on Tudor drama and politics. So those are two very, very good books also written on this subject. So I want to uh, get started on this uh, presentation here by quoting Palmer's uh, political and comic characters in Shakespeare. And he says it's a strange paradox that Shakespeare, who above all other dramatists was preoccupied with the private mind and heart of the individual, should have written a group of plays unmatched in any literature for their political content. And this was back in 1945, he's writing this. Um, in uh, the, uh, John, Jan Kott, the very, very highly renowned Polish Shakespeare specialist in Shakespeare, our contemporary, has this to say, and it's a very, very interesting comment. 
Once a language had its fully adequate version of Shakespeare, it became able to support the foundations of a nation, its institutions, its political autonomy. Only the Bible rivals Shakespeare in this aspect of archetypal significance. Now, Wally Hurst has been doing some work on the German response to Shakespeare that suggests that, in fact, the organization of the German nation had something to do with uh, the dissemination of Shakespeare uh, throughout uh, the, the, the uh, throughout Germany during that time. And even during World War II, the German st students were studying Shakespeare uh, very, very seriously. So uh, that's an interesting idea that Shakespeare's language itself provides the, the linguistic foundation for a culture. Now I want to talk a little bit about what is available to you online today. In the White House, Shakespeare and the US presidents is a wonderful website that talks to about the, the presidents who were profoundly influenced by Shakespeare. And among them were Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, John Quincy Adams, and Abraham Lincoln. And just have a few comments about each of them because this comes right off of that website. It's a wonderful place to look and see how our early presidents in the first 100 years of, of our nation uh, were profoundly influenced by, by Shakespeare. What Adams had to say, and he and Jefferson actually made a pilgrimage to, to Stratford-upon-Avon 20 years after the Jubilee of David Garrett. Yet there wasn't much going on over there that, that in interested them. Jefferson didn't have anything to say other than he logged in how much it cost them to go to the Birthplace Trust, the Holy Trinity Church, and the other sites that were designated uh, historical sites. Adams, on the other hand, had quite a bit to say. Uh, Adams says this about Shakespeare, that he was the great teacher of morality and politics, the great master of every affection of the heart and every sentiment of the mind, as well as all the powers of expression. But when he got to Stratford, expressed grave disappointment of what he found there. There is nothing preserved of this great genius, which is worth knowing, nothing which might inform us what education, what company, what accident turned his mind to letters and drama. His name is not even on his tombstone. And a recent uh, scan of that tomb in the floor of Holy Trinity Church suggested there was, even wasn't a skull in that tomb. So, you know, it's, it's a bit of a mystery. Where did, where did Shakespeare's head go? We don't know. Um, John Quincy Adams was America's, among America's foremost abolitionists, and he defended the Amistad slaves who had, you know, mutinied and uh, sailed their boat right into Plymouth and into Boston Harbor, and he defended them all the way to the Supreme Court. So he was a profoundly concerned citizen who, uh, who was very deeply affected by Shakespeare, loved Hamlet, among other of the tragedies, but he had no patience for Othello or for Lear. He said that Lear was a dotard. He didn't think that Lear was a very good play at all, but he was particularly upset about Othello. And this is what he has to say in several articles he wrote about this uh, in, in his, in his, during his lifetime. He says this about Desdemona. Who can sympathize with Desdemona, the daughter of a Venetian nobleman who falls in love and makes a runaway match with a blackamoor for no better reason than that he told her a braggart story of his hairbreadth escapes in war? For this, she not only violates the duties to her father, her family, her sex, and her country, the great moral lesson of Othello was that black and white blood cannot be intermingled in marriage without a gross outrage upon the law of nature. So he was OK about abolition. He was OK about human rights. But he was not OK about miscegenation. Um, he was opposed to that. So th that shows you that th th in his time, as strong a person as he was and as, and as moral a person as he was, he did not see the races as being uh, uh, in a good situation to be mixed. So now Abraham Lincoln, you know, he says he had a six months of education in the school. So he was an autodidact. He loved Shakespeare. And where he learned Shakespeare was from a variety of sources. But when he got to, to, to Washington, the four years that he lived there in, in Washington, D.C., he went to over 100 performances of different plays. And he would often have the leading actors come to visit him in his box afterwards, or even come to the White House and have discourses. And he would love to spend the evenings reading Shakespeare to, to his, to his giz, visitors. His favorite play was Macbeth. There's a description of him in one of the plays that he had given during the Civil War. Uh, the plays gave him peace and respite from the stresses and strains of the Civil War presidency. Quote, he was, he, he was during the production of Henry IV, uh, part one. He has forget, forgotten the war. He has forgotten conference, Congress. He is out of politics. He is living in Prince Hal's time. So Lincoln was particularly influenced by Shakespeare uh, and loved to quote him. Now, his assassin, John Wilkes Booth, was also came from a Shakespeare family. His, his father, Junius Brutus uh, Booth, 
was a famous English Shakespeare actor who migrated, uh, emigrated to America. And his older brother, Edwin uh, Booth, was also a very famous Shakespeare actor. And they performed a number of Shakespeare productions. John Wilkes Booth saw himself as a Brutus. He actually identified himself in a notebook he wrote during the time that he was being pursued after the assassination. He thought that he was a, the Brutus who was taking down a tyrant, uh, that Lincoln was a tyrant. Uh, so from completely opposite uh, standpoints, uh, we have uh, uh, historical characters who were inspired by Shakespeare and taking completely different interpretations. And we're going to go forward because that continues uh, in, in the history. Now let's look at what's going on here in the 21st century today the, in recent productions within the last few years. And I'm going to feature just a couple of productions for you uh, from very contemporary representations. This is an image from a production of a play, of a Shakespeare play, at the Guthrie Theater directed by Rob Melrose. That was in 2012. Now, what Shakespeare play starts with some balls being held by one of the characters. You think of Henry V and the tennis balls that the, uh, that the French had sent him as an insult. But no, this is not tennis balls in Henry V. This is a production of the tragedy of Julius Caesar. And in 2012, the character playing Caesar was an Obama-like character who knew how to handle a basketball, which was an identifier, of course, of our uh, 44th president. Um, and of course, during the production, he does get assassinated, and he does uh, lay on, you know, lay out. Now, this is produced in Minneapolis at the, at the world famous Guthrie Theater. It went on national tour. It, it was produced on Broadway for at least two months, and there was no commentary, no critiquing of the fact that an Obama like character was portrayed on the stage in a tragedy in which he is assassinated. Uh, the message, I think, of this play is that assassination, political assassination, is, is not a good thing. It results in civil war. It results in a greater tyranny in time. And that is perhaps the one thing that you know, people understood when they saw this production. Fast forward five years to 2017, the year after the election of our current president, and you have Oscar Eustace's public theater production of The Tragedy of Julius Caesar at the Delacorte Theater in Central Park. Now, the public has produced Hare, Chorus Line, Hamilton. It's won 50 Tony, more than 50 Tony Awards, world-class theater. And the Delacorte Theater seats about 2,300 people. Uh, the, the shows are free. And if you want to get a taste for what goes on in that theater, I highly recommend a video that's available on YouTube called Kiss Me Pertuccio. And it shows the actors Merle Streep and Raul Julia performing as Kate and Petruchio in a wonderful Joseph Pat production uh, that features them in this. And you'll get a nice feeling for what that Delacorte theater is like. But in any case, this is portrayed as a President Caesar. And you, there are all these emblems of the American uh, uh, political life on the stage there with our flag showing there, and a rather tyrannical looking uh, portrayal of Caesar in this, in this particular scene. There is even a line they inserted that he could have stabbed your mother on Fifth Avenue and you would still support him for, for, for his presidency. So they, they, they took up, a, they inserted some lines and they had supernumerary actors in the audience who would respond by yelling and cheering and shouting and yelling uh, during the production. Uh, they had about 40 actors actually in the theater, in the theater itself uh, acting out and responding to the actions on the stage. However, this scene in which the, the assassination occurs was a rather brutal scene. Now, they emphasized the, the, the violence in this, in this particular production. It's a modern production. They had automatic weapons. They, they brought the conspirators out. They mowed them down. There was cannon fire in the distance, you know, artillery. And, and it, was, it was done in a, a way that magnified the violence, uh, particularly in this play. So the crowd was particularly you know, responsive to this. And there was a, a brief period of the assassination in which Caesar really fights back. Uh, he fought back like a boar, they said. Uh, so, so it was a particularly violent assassination. Uh, he didn't go down easily. Well, there was a 12-minute video clip that went viral that was seen by half a million people. And that resulted in millions of responses on social media that, that went, went crazy. The right-wing media, Breitbart News, uh, some of the uh, uh, commentators on Fox and others had, were totally upset about this scene. And eventually, uh, actors would come in, people who were hired would come in and rush the stage. Uh, Laura Loomer, 
uh, who's now running for Congress in, in Florida, rushed the stage during one of the last productions and yelled out to the crowd, you know, this is un unseemly. This is, you should be ashamed of yourself. I'm saving President Trump from being killed uh, in, in Central Park. And that was the headline in Breitbart News, you know, uh, President Trump assassinated in Central Park and the liberals are cheering for this, which was totally bananas. The, out, the outrage resulted in thousands of phone calls and letters and responses. Delta Airlines pulled out of the production of the sponsorship. Bank of America pulled out. The National Endowment of the Arts had to issue a disclaimer. We had nothing to do with this particular production. The people were shocked by the overreaction to this production uh, of, of Julius Caesar. It ran its, its, its course, but that was, that was the uh, you know, outcome of another production. So you see the differences in responses just a few years apart, depending on the nature of the production and the, the emotional uh, content and, and of, the, of, uh, of, that, of that scene. I, I'm sure it was quite shocking to Oscar Eustace, and uh, there were a number of comments, and he just did not believe uh, Dallas, Shakespeare Dallas received 40 threatening uh, emails. All over the country, Shakespeare festivals were being attacked for what was going on, on the, in Delacourt Theater in, in Central Park. So I just want to let you know, Shakespeare can be very political even today. Now, the Oregon Shakespeare Festival has, has been known to do similar uh, projects. This is a uh, production uh, in the Thomas Theater, The Tragedy of Julius Caesar. Clearly, with all these banners, as, the, as you go into the theater, suggested that this is put in the context of modern assassinations. Uh, you have the Kennedy brothers on the left up near the entry there, and you have Malcolm X and Martin Luther King uh, uh, across from them, and then other international political leaders, including Abraham Lincoln. Uh, that was the context they created to help, uh, help the audience contextualize in a historical sense what, they, what the meaning of this particular play is. Another production at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival of the tragedy of Julius Caesar was particularly disturbing. And I attended this in 1982. I took my brother-in-law, who was a colonel in the Air Force at that time. Uh, what was brilliant about this play, was directed by Jerry Turner, is that the, um, uh, it was done in a, as a Latin coup. There were little posters that said Caesar around and used to see Che for Che Guevara, you know, during the Cuban Revolution, that he was popular, and he was a doctor also, actually. Um, so, so it was, the context was of a Latin Revolution. You had that clearly in your mind when you saw the production. Right at the, at, right before intermission, right after the assassination of Caesar, he's laying there in a bloody mess on the stage. The this, this conspirators are all putting blood on their hands to prove that they were part of this. The doors, the six doors to the Bomer Theater open up, and in stepped actors, in military outfits with automatic weapons, and you hear them go click, click, like they set their things to start firing. Suddenly, we were all in Santiago, Chile, because less than a decade previously, the Chilean revolution that overthrew Salvador Allende and installed Pinochet resulted in 4,000 executions, 40,000 prisoners were kept in the national stadium for up to two years and tortured there, Several hundred thousand people went into exile. During the 1980s, this was one of the most huge you know, political events of that time, and Jerry Turner gave us a feeling of what that was like. And then the, and then the soldiers disappeared, the actors disappeared, the doors opened, the lights came up, we all went down and had our, our wine and our coffee, whatever we could have. Well, my brother-in-law, who was a colonel in the Air Force, um, was utterly silent. He was very disturbed. He said nothing for the rest of the day and the evening. The next morning, he got up and told me that was the most fantastic Shakespeare play he ever saw. It had a powerful impact on a military man. And so this, this was very, anybody who saw that play remembers it vividly, remembers that chilling feeling of now we too are caught in this, in this drama. It, it, was, it was incredible. Um, so Hamlet, done 10 years ago in, as a modern security state, Ophelia's wearing a wire. You know, so, and there's security cameras around, you know, spying on everybody. So they did, they did it in that theme. Um, and then they did, you know, a Middle East war theme for Troilus and Cressida, which, of course, on the Troy, in modern-day Turkey, was somewhat in the Middle East there. They did a similar theme with Coriolanus and portrayed it also as a Middle Eastern war uh, during the time of the height of the Iraq war. So these were ways that that Oregon Shakespeare Festival has implemented and used a contemporary political and, and, and military situations to be represented on their stage to be, give commentaries on, well, what, where is the moral value in these, in these uh, enterprises? Most recently, it was a production of Timon of Athens on Broadway just last year uh, with a female Timon. 
as a one percenter party girl, throwing a vast banquet for all her friends. And then, of course, you know, the, the, it, it, everything goes south for a time and runs out of money, ends up in the wilderness. And the final scene of the play, which is not in Shakespeare's text at all, is a pieta-like image at the very end of the play. Normally, like in the Greek drama, the death occurs off stage, and there's no vision, a, visit, a visioning of the dead body. Timon dies mysteriously uh, in the Greek manner. Uh, that's appropriate. But this Broadway production emphasized how bereft Timon was and how terrible all the people were who had turned against Timon in, in his time of need. So you can see how these things have, have occurred in, in modern theater. Now, I bring up this image of Mark Rylance in his wonderful production of uh, Richard III, he and the company from the Globe Theater was an all-male company. They, they ran this in the Globe Theater in London. Then they put it out at the Apollo Theater. And then they came to Broadway with, the, with uh, Richard III and uh, Twelfth Night. He won the Tony Award for Best Supporting Actor for the Twelfth Night on that occasion. But I got to see him when I was in London in 2012 performing as Richard III. And you had a real good feeling for how terrible a person this Richard is, and how mean and how awful and immoral he was. And of course, some of the things that Richard does resonated with Stephen Greenblatt on the eve of the uh, 2016 election. He wrote some comments in a letter to the editor, and then he expanded that into this book, Tyrant. And I want to show you a few quotes from his book, Tyrant, that reference Richard III. Well, he says here that the word politician in Shakespeare was virtually synonymous with hypocrite. I'm not so sure about that but that's his opinion on that. But he said, Richard III promises to make England great again. The absurdity of the demagogue's rhetoric was blatantly obvious. These are all quotes from Greenblatt's book. Sexual conquest excites him, but only for the endlessly reiterated proof that he can have it all. Uh, I think he's reading into the text a little bit, but the seduction of, uh, of Anne after you know uh, Richard catches, catches up with her, the corpse of her husband, uh, suggests there were some, some parallels there, certainly. And these last comments, I think, are particularly um, relevant. He talks about fake news, that Richard will issue drunken prophecies, libels, and talk about dreams, a steady barrage of falsehoods, and to sow confusion. And these are all quotes directly from Shakespeare that, that Greenblatt uses in his book, Tyrant. He also talks about Coriolanus and King Lear and other tech characters. But his, he really focuses on Richard III as, as, as exemplar of a true tyrant. Then, of course, in the campaign to become king, Richard obviously shows fraudulent display of religious piety. You can just think about holding up the Bible. The slandering of opponents and an exaggerated threat to national security. Finally, he says this, that we are charmed again and again by the villain's outrageousness, by his indifference to the ordinary norms of human decency, by lies that seem affected even though no one believes them. In other words, he's, he's bizarre and yet he's charismatic. And it's that combination that, that, that is so compelling to some followers of an authoritarian type consciousness. So these are some of the things that have been happening in very recent years. Let's go back. 50, 75 years to the mid portion of the 20th century, because there again, we see some evidence of these kinds of things happening. Now, Kenneth Branagh's uh, Henry V, 1982, what a wonderful cast. Paul Schofield, Ian Holm, uh, Derek Jacobi, Judy Dench, he had a fabulous cast, and he got nominated for Academy Award for Best Actor and Best Director. It was his first directorial debut. So Henry V is a good platform if you're gonna show a great, probably, probably the most popular Shakespeare play ever produced, it made more money than any other Shakespeare play uh, in film. Now, Stephen Marks commenting in 1992, some years after that, says that in Henry V, Shakespeare aims the full blast of his rhetorical power at the audience. The choruses inflame us to collaborate with the author in producing a spectacle to sweep away thought in a, in a flood of patriotic passion. Okay, Flood of patriotic passion. All right. Henry, this is what... Uh, John Julius Norwich, whose wonderful book, Shakespeare's Kings, I highly recommend this book. It's an excellent look at the history of Shakespeare's Kings and compare them to the actual characters in, in their lives. Henry V, though by no means the greatest of Shakespeare's histories, is the only one that ranks as a true epic, a patriotic paean celebrating England's only royal hero, the triumphant conclusion of a nine-part work that had taken the author the first decade of his active life. Now, this is another image of Sir Laurence Olivier as Henry V. 
This is a 1944 production of Henry V, the first film in Technicolor to come out of England at that time. There was one Technicolor camera in all of England. Guess who wanted him to do this? Winston Churchill. Guess why it was being done? Because it was to build up the English identity and cohesiveness and the thrust in, back into Europe in 1944 on D-Day, the day I was born, actually, 1944. So here's, here's, the, here's beautiful Laurence Olivier starring in this. Now, who was behind this? Well, it was Winston Churchill who instructed Olivier to fashion the film, which was filmed in Ireland, which was a neutral party during World War II, um, boosting the propaganda for British troops invading, and its release in London corresponded with the D-Day invasion. Okay, And it ran for a full year in London theaters. It was the most popular film at that time in production. And it won Olivier uh, several Academy Awards, for an honorary Academy Award as being the director and producer and lead actor in this, in this show. It won him you know, a special, special honor. But it was, it was released to coincide exactly with the invasion of Normandy uh, with the British troops invading France again. Now, it's partly funded by the British government, um, and you know, it was dedicated to those who had fought for England in, in past uh, battles. Now, here's the director's cut. It's very interesting what he did. He intentionally left out many of Henry's harsher scenes. There was no beheading of the Southampton plotters. There's no threat to unleash his troops to rape and pillage Harfleur if the city refused to surrender. It's got to be nice to the French, because actually they're their allies at this point. There's no cutting the throats of the French prisoners during the Battle of Agincourt. And there's no refusal to stop the hanging of his old friend Bardolph for looting. In other words, he kind of cleaned it up. He whitewashed this so that there was no anti-French sentiment. It was simply Henry being big. And of course, the final scene shows some reconciliation between the French and the English, which is you know, uh, uh, suitable for that situation. But it was done as a wartime propaganda film. Now, what about across the English Channel? Uh, I thank Wally Hurst for these next few slides that I'm going to show you. Because England was not alone in their love of Shakespeare at that time. Germany was equally invested in Shakespeare of that time. And he, he, these, are, these are some slides and quotes from, from Wally's wonderful, wonderful slideshow. Uh, his presentation is available on the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship uh, video uh, conference videos from, I believe, 2017 that he presented that. So I would advise you to go look at that if you're more interested in, these, in this topic. But these are just some selected slides from him, from German scholars who were commenting on the importance of Shakespeare to the German nation, the German people, the German identity. There is no nation, not even the English nation, that can lay a better claim to Shakespeare than the German nation. Shakespeare's characters are part of our world. His soul has merged with ours. And though he was born and buried in England, Germany is the country where he truly lives. And that's from Gerhard Hauptmann, the Nobel Prize laureate, writing in 1915 during World War I. Okay? Another World War I scholar, Ludwig Fulda, says this, and if we succeed in defeating England, then I think we should insert a clause in the peace treaty that William Shakespeare has to be formally transferred to Germany. I even believe the English would be rather prepared to consent to this transfer because they do not know how to deal with him properly anyway. A little arrogance there, I'd say. Uh, no doubt, uh, uh, William Roth, another very famous German intellectual of that period in the pre-World War II era, says, there is no other instance on record where the mental and artistic exponent of a whole epic, Shakespeare, was so absolutely become amalgamated with the neighboring nation, kindred in race and character, to be sure, yet actually separated by language and totally different political development, Germany. Well, what about Der Fuhrer? Well, this is a quote from Goebbels' private diary that is fascinating. Here's what Goebbels has to say. Hitler also owned the collected works of William Shakespeare, published in German translation in 1925 by George Muller as part of a series intended to make great literature available to the general public. The entire set is bound in hand-tooled Moroccan leather with a gold-embossed eagle flanked with his initials on the spine. He considered Shakespeare superior to Goethe and Schiller at every respect. Why was it, he wondered, the German Enlightenment produced Nathan the Wise, the story of a rabbi who reconciles Christians, Muslims, and Jews, well, it had been left to Shakespeare to give us the world of the Merchant of Venice and Shylock. Okay? So, depending on which side of the channel on, Shakespeare seemed to have some profound influence on the identity of both the English and the German nations. And we have many wonderful German scholars who are interested in the Shakespeare authorship question. Hannah Wember out there, yes, and most recently deceased, our, our dear friend Robert de Tobel. Uh, several German scholars, uh, uh, 
there are others who are also doing research on the Shakespeare officer question. So Germany is also interested in this, in this particular question. What about the other fascist uh, uh, nations during that same period? Well, here's an image of Mussolini superimposed on Julius Caesar. Mussolini wrote an adaptation of Julius Caesar and had it performed before 35,000 people in a square in Rome. Obviously, he, had an, he identified himself with Julius Caesar and thought that this was a fabulous play that, that inspired, inspired him to actually write a whole new script that, that adapted the tragedy of Julius Caesar. Well, what about the Japanese fascist? Well, here's the Japanese foreign minister playing Hamlet in 1932. So obviously they like, I mean, we have Kurosawa's adaptation, The Throne of Blood, adaptation of uh, Macbeth. Uh, he was fascinated by Shakespeare, no doubt. And finally, a professor of English in, in Japan in, in, during World War II says this, down with the Yanks, down with the Brit, Brits, they are our enemies. See Shakespeare. He is ours as well. So clearly Shakespeare had some influence in both the you know, allied side and on the uh, fascist side during World War II era. So just to make that fit. Now we're going to jump back to the 16th century, a little time warp, okay? So we're, we're shifting gears right now, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Shakespeare and politics contemporary to his time. John Dover Wilson, in the Essential Shakespeare writing almost 100 years ago, says, Elizabethan drama was a social institution that performed many functions. Among other things, it's like a modern newspaper. In a word, it was topical. That word topical, you won't find many Shakespeare scholars mentioning the word topical. Shakespeare wasn't topical. Shakespeare was universal. Shakespeare was eternal. He's not referencing any activities or, or political situations or whatever personally that are going on during this time. We're going to challenge that in talking about Hamlet and A Midsummer Night's Dream toward the end of this discussion. What was going on in England during that time? Well, there was a cultural revolution of an extraordinary nature. We think of the digital revolution in our time as being extraordinary and having transformed people's lives. Think of what happened in England during the late 16th century. Between 1575 and 1587, huge playhouses were constructed in London. Can you imagine that? Seven gone up in a town of 200,000 people. So that's pretty remarkable, isn't it? I mean, suddenly you've got this flowering, this burst of energy. The classical Greeks had something similar to this go on. The productivity during the Golden Age of Athens, which was a very narrow period of time, about 50 years, it was mirrored again in the English period of time during this highly creative time of the last quarter of the 15th century, uh, 16th century and the, and the first years of the 17th century. During the 1590s, more than 500 different plays were staged in England. Now, we only have you know, a, a fraction of that number extant, but we have documentary evidence that there were that many plays that were in production for, with different companies, and there were 30 different men's and boys' companies operating uh, throughout England during that time, many of them focused on London, but also some traveling troops. The Lord Admiral's men put on 35 plays per year during that time. Now, the Oregon Shakespeare Festival puts on 11 plays a year. We think that's fantastic. But 35 plays a year. So it was a massive uh, cultural revolution going on. I think people really appreciate what a huge influence it had and, and how widely it was accepted as uh, a mode by which people related to each other. The uh, one penny admission, of course, guaranteed that you would kick the groundlings in there, and you pay two pennies, you get into the gallery, and if you really have some bucks, you can actually sit on the stage. So, but more than 20,000 people every week, so 10% of the population of London saw a play every week. So, you know, do, do the arithmetic. Everybody sees about 10 plays a year at least. So, very popular. Andrew Gurr, long quote here. Sorry, I'm, I'm, this is a very wordy <laughs> presentation. We'll get through this. Uh, it was the only major medium for social intercommunication, other than hangings and, and going to church, of course. He says, the fictions of the stage were certainly not so marginal to the affairs of state because imaginative thought had few other outlets and none with the cohesiveness or coerciveness, excuse me, of the minds of the men in company. Uh, Peter Lake, in his book on uh, how Shakespeare put politics back on the stage, says, and this is an important quote, in an emergently absolutist personal monarchy, so this is the Elizabethan era. You know, and Greenblatt calls this as bad as North Korea is today in terms of the control of the media and what got published and what you could get away with. During that absolutist personal monarchy and during a period in which issues of succession and legitimacy were much on people's minds, the plays were consistently about kings and queens were quintessentially political plays. And here's his final and more, really most important point, and it really points to the work of Ramon Jimenez uh, in his book, uh, Shakespeare's Apprenticeship. 
because he talks about the productions put down by the Queen's Men in the 1580s. The Queen's Men and the apocryphal Shakespeare, we're talking about the famous victories of Henry V, the true tragedy of Richard III, King John, King Lear. The, invent in the inventing of the English history play is, his, is, his, is the chapter he takes us from. There is no question that these plays represent a campaign to give legitimacy to a Protestant drive for substantial truth and that the Queen's Men provided the regime with uh, the ideal means to bring the theater back into the service of a Protestant ideology which could be identified with the truth of Tudor history. Now, where did Tudor history come from? Well, Lily Campbell agrees with him that each of Shakespeare's histories serves as a special purpose in elucidating a political problem of Elizabethan's day and the bringing to bear upon the problem accepted political philosophy of the Tudors. So we're saying that this is supportive of the Tudor regime, of Elizabeth's claim to the throne, of her legitimacy. And of course, the primary sources for the history plays are Hall's Chronicles and Hollinshed's Chronicle. Uh, so Tilliard interprets these things as saying it's a repository of political dogma supporting the divine election of the Tudors. So, you know, the Ricardian Society, of course, has, has fought this idea that Richard III was such a terrible person, but he was assassinated by Queen Elizabeth's grand grandfather. So that establishes her legitimacy because Richard was such a terrible person, but that's only because Hollingshead and Halls kind of painted it that way. So they demonized Richard III. Well, let's talk a little bit about censorship and subversive and satiric Shakespeare. And I'm going to kind of race through a lot of stuff here. I do recommend you take a look at the article that's in the syllabus on my article on the um, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream as a, an Aristophanic political satire. I think that'll give you a lot of the information I'm going to be presenting to you over the next 15 minutes here as we proceed through a, a bunch of stories about both Hamlet and a Midsummer Night's Dream. Now, if you were a playwright in London during that time, you were a little bit at risk of being imprisoned and tortured. Of course, Marlowe was interviewed by the Star Chamber, accused of atheism, and if you think the documents are valid, he was assassinated in 1593. There are some Marlowians who believe that it was a, it was a cover up and that he somehow shipped off to the continent and wrote the works of Shakespeare uh, from someplace in Europe. Thomas Kidd, who was Marlowe's uh, roommate, was arrested, tortured in Bridewell Prison, and died just a year later, perhaps as a, as a consequence of the various things that had happened while he was tortured during Bridewell Prison. Thomas Nash was imprisoned on several occasions for writing Christ Tears Over Jerusalem and also was co-authoring The Isle of Dogs. His books were burned publicly. Ben Johnson was imprisoned on the, for The Isle of Dogs at Eastward Hull along with George Chapman. But was Shakespeare ever arrested? No. Was he ever interrogated? No. Was he ever called forward because of things he had written? No. Now, this is a scene, the deposition scene from Richard II, uh, produced by the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. That's Jeffrey King on the right there as, as uh, uh, you know, claiming the, the throne, uh, Henry Bolingbroke. Uh, look how fierce he looks. I mean, that's an impressive view. Well, this was a very, very sub subversive scene. The deposition of a royally anointed king is not something you take lightly. After all, the execution of Mary, Queen of Scots, caused Spain fine to declare war and uh, send the Armada in 1588. So you don't assassinate a anointed king or queen without consequences. But somehow Shakespeare got away with this. Uh, first of all, the Earl of Essex paid his followers, was, uh, uh, his followers provided for a command performance. They paid double to have the Lord Chamberlain's men put on a production of Richard II in 1601 on the eve of the rebellion. Right. Now, it might have been a setup that Robert Cecil had, had, had invoked. We're not sure about that. The, the history on that is not completely clear. But it's interesting that the Earl of Essex was actually interested in Richard II four years previously, according to commentaries by Sir Walter Raleigh. He said the conceit of Richard II hath made the Earl of Essex wonderful Mary. So for whatever reason, Essex thought that this represented something that he believed in. So the deposition could not be included in the published quartos. And Queen Elizabeth says in an interview, in the months after the execution of Essex, that she says, know you not that I am Richard, that she was identified as the, as, as the target of, of Essex rebellion in that time, that he was attempting to depose her at that time. It was Augustine Phillips, who was a member of Lord Chamberlain's uh, company, who was questioned. But no arrests were made, and the, they continued to make plays at court. In fact, on the eve of Essex's execution, the Lord Chamberlain's men produced a play at court that very evening. Now we're going to move on to Hamlet. This is Mel Gibson and Zeffirelli's adaptation of Hamlet, a very fine production, I thought. 
Other people perhaps some, had some objections to this. Uh, but the tragedy of Hamlet, according to Heron Goddard, whose wonderful collection, The Meaning of Shakespeare, uh, I think really points to an Oxfordian source. To nearly everyone, both Hamlet himself and the play give the impression of having some particularly intimate relationship to their creator. Hamlet is the most bewildering, most fascinating of all his plays, largely autobiographical. This is Shakespeare himself. Now, no, there isn't an Oxfordian here who would disagree with, with that. And this is an image from Kenneth Branagh's production of Hamlet uh, as he's uh, mocking uh, the uh, appearance of old men. He, he references the satiric slave and he's insulting Polonius here for being an older man and, and ha lacking wit and having weak legs and all this. And he's actually quoting from the satire by the Roman satirist Juvenal, his 10th satire. It's very interesting that Juvenal was not recognized as the author of the satires that he wrote for 250 years. So they hid, Juvenal hid his identity because writing those satires was politically dangerous during the time that he was actually writing these things that were critical of the, of the Roman emperors. So, uh, so there, there's a long history of Juvenal actually avoiding you know, identification as the author of these really very clever satires. And if you're interested in this, I would recommend his 10th satire because it does, it does parallel in many ways what Hamlet is telling Polonius in this case. Well, Laurence Olivier, again, paralleling Branagh and Olivier, had a very famous scene, uh, a very famous production of Hamlet in 1948. He won the Academy Award for Best Actor. The, uh, the production won Best Movie. It was the first foreign film ever to win the Academy Award. Um, and, you know, it was, it was renowned. Now, it was started with the man who couldn't make, a, make up his mind, is, was Olivier's approach. And he showed him as a blonde, sort of Teutonic person who was very much attached to his mother, kind of a Freudian interpretation. But here he is having assassinated uh, Polonius inadvertently, you know, behind the, di the dais there. So what about, what about Polonius and Hamlet? Well, Lord Burley was clearly identified by scholars going back 150 years ago as the model for Polonius. Burley was Elizabeth's primary advisor for the 45 years that she was in power. Uh, her number one, he was a treasurer, the, her first secretary, her spy master. He was her, he was, he was her man, you know, in more ways than you can imagine. Burley was also the Earl of Oxford's uh, guardian from the time he was 12 until he was 21. For nine years, he lived in, 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 on, on the, in uh, Cecil House on the Strand as a uh, ward of the court. Uh, under Burley's tutelage. He married Burley's daughter, Anne Cecil, uh, so he was very connected and had reasons to you know, know what Cecil was like. Well, what are the identifying features that connect Cecil and Polonius? Now, in the first quarto of Hamlet, which we, of which we only have one copy, actually, the Polonius character is named Cor Ambus. The uh, translation of that Latin expression would be double heart or split heart, okay? Polonius, uh, see, uh, Burley's motto was cor unum via unum, one heart, one way. So naming the character Corambus, a little bit pointing in that direction, okay? Uh, and then there are the certain precepts, which of course he pu were published posthumously, um, and long after Shakespeare had, or whoever wrote Hamlet, had written Hamlet, which were uh, apparently the sources for the precepts that uh, Polonius lays out Laertes before he heads off to, to university in Paris. Well, during that time uh, in the play, uh, Reynaldo was sent to spy on Laertes, just like William Cecil sent spies to, 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 to spy on his son, his older son, Thomas Cecil. So we have that parallel. And of course, Anne Cecil would be in the place of Ophelia, the somewhat abused daughter. Uh, Hamlet accuses uh, Polonius as being a fishmonger. Uh, Cecil tried to get Parliament to pass a law that would force people to eat fish twice a week. Uh, if they live within 15 miles of, of the ocean or the, or, the, or the channel. So, you know, he was, he was referring to him as a fishmonger. And that's been a recognized connection for about 150 years. But today, you won't get Stephen Greenblatt or James Shapiro or, or Jonathan Bate to suggest that. No, no, no. But that, that association means nothing. The number of tags and, and, and identifiers are, I think, hard to resist. Mark Alexander has written very commendably about this, and, and his website is identified there. Source textbook, go look for that Polonius article that, that shows all those parallels. And I want to quote one passage from Cecil's precepts. And this is one that, that makes me want to mock him. It has to do with the choice of the wife. Use great providence and circumspection in the choice of thy wife. Do not be too poor, neither choose a base and uncomely creature altogether for wealth, for it will cause contempt in others and loathing in thee. Make not choice of a dwarf or a fool, 
For from the one thou mayest beget a race of pygmies, and the other may thy daily disgrace, for it will irk thee to have her talk. You can imagine having to sit through dinners and listen to this kind of talk, and you would want to mock it later in a play that identifies this character. So anyway, what about Queen Elizabeth? And we're coming down to the last 20 minutes here of my presentation. I'm going to really drill down a little bit on A Midsummer Night's Dream and Queen Elizabeth as being represented uh, as Queen Titania in A Midsummer Night's Dream. My article on this, I think, is easily available on the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship website. The link is there in your, in your syllabus. Helen Hackett, in her wonderful book, Shakespeare and Elizabeth, The Meeting of Two Myths, has this to say. The clearest reference to Queen Elizabeth in Shakespeare's works is arguably Oberon's vision in A Midsummer Night's Dream, the subject of more voluminous speculation than any other 25 lines in all of Shakespeare. And these are some of those lines. It refers to the fair vestal thrown by the West. Clearly, Elizabeth. She's in the West. She's throned. She's the vestal virgin. Okay. Cupid all armed, a certain aim he took at a fair vesta, loosed his love shaft smartly from his bow, as it should pierce a hundred thousand hearts. But I might see Cupid's fiery shaft quenched, and the chaste beams of the watery moon, and the imperial votaress passed on in maiden meditation fancy free. So the arrow misses, lands on that purple flower. Okay? The watery moon, the moon, the imperial votaress, those are other identifiers associated with Queen Elizabeth. Well, what about this thing where Titania is madly in love with a monster? with an ass-headed bottom, okay? Well, Jonathan Bate has this to say about that in his really fine book, otherwise, in Shakespeare and Ovid, 1993. Shakespeare cannot afford to license the interpretation of this as an image of the queen in a perverse encounter which upsets both the natural and social order. If such an interpretation were at all in, in prominent, the master of the revels would not have licensed the play, okay? So he says, no, you cannot do that. And yet other scholars writing in the Shakespeare Quarterly somewhat earlier, uh, John Allen says, Queen Elizabeth, as the emblem of sovereignty, is the political equivalent of Titania, the emblem of nature's sway over living things. And of course, Titania's fight with Oberon is what causes these floods, the crop failures, and all the things that are going wrong in England that, that are described in the early scenes of A Midsummer Night's Dream. Now, here's the one line within the play that I think clearly points to a topical allusion that connects Elizabeth with Titania. Titania says this, after her first encounter with, with Bottom under the influence of the love potion, she's about to take him off. She's going off to her bower, and they're going to go to, to bed together, or whatever it is. She says, the moon, methinks, looks with a watery eye, and when she weeps, weeps every little flower, lamenting some enforced chastity. Okay? What does that really mean? What does that really mean? Well, Elizabeth, of course, is associated with the moon, the goddess Diana, She's named Titania in the, in the Latin version of Ovid's Metamorphoses, one of Shakespeare's most enriched sources, and certainly the, the source for the story of Pyramus and Thisbe that they make a mockery of at the, at, in the uh, Rude Mechanicals, uh, uh, little, little shtick at the very end of the play. Elizabeth's women of the chamber were bribed by Christopher Hatton to wail all night long and keep the queen awake the night that she announced her engagement to the Duke of Alençon in 1581. She was with her minister. She was angry at them. She said, I'll marry him. And they exchanged, she, they exchanged rings right then, right there, in front of Earl of Leicester, who was horrified, William Cecil, who was, who was shocked by this sudden move. That night, Hatton paid the, the, the women of the bedchamber to cry all night, not let the queen sleep. And in the morning, she returned the ring to, to Alan San, the duke, and said, I'm sorry, we've got to call it off. They, my, my ministers, my people, they will not tolerate me marrying a Catholic. I'm sorry, we can't go forward with this. This one image within the play suggests Elizabeth's identification with Titania. It's enough for me. But we have much more to go with, with the Duke of Alençon. Now, the Duke of Alençon was known as Monsieur. He was the youngest brother of Catherine de Medici. His older brother was King Henry III of France. He was the next in line. Henry III had no children. Uh, Henry IV was uh, the former Henry Navarre, uh, you know, from you know, Navarre. So the Duke of Alençon stood in line to become King of France eventually. His, name, his birth name was Hercule de Valois, but he was small. He was not a Hercules character, Hercule, the French, pronunci the French pronunciation of Hercules. And later at his christening, he was named after his elder brother who had died, King Francois. So was, he, he was actually called Francois Hercule 
de Valois. So he, Francois and Hercule are the two names that are associated at this first name, but he was referred to as Monsieur. This is an image from the Valois tapestries that the, uh, uh, the Catherine de Medici may have uh, financed. Uh, the, um, William of Orange also may have been involved in creating these wonderful Dutch tapestries that show uh, the regal nature of the Duke of Alençon and other members of the, the Medici family. Uh, here's an image from the Dutch painter, a uh, contemporary with that, which shows Queen Elizabeth and William of Orange standing at the front of the cow. Queen Philip of Spain is sitting on top of the cow, which is the emblem of the Low Countries, of Hall of the Netherlands at the time. And there's the Duke of Alençon at the very back, holding onto the tail. And if you look carefully at his left leg, you will see a certain excrement is being di distributed upon him by the Dutch. He was sent as Elizabeth's proxy to fight the Spanish in the Low Countries and became invested as the Duke of Brabant, referred to in Love's Labor's, uh, Re yes, Love's Labor's Lost. Um, but he was an unsuccessful uh, military commander. And after a year in, in Holland, he was run out. He tried to bring on the French uh, I army into Antwerp. The citizens of Antwerp turned them away. There was, there was uh, mass killings of the French troops. Alençon withdrew to, to France, and at the age of 29, he died of a broken heart, basically. But, uh, but his story and his relationship with Elizabeth is critical to our understanding about Bottom and Titania. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So he was first, Alençon was first offered in marriage to Elizabeth in 1573 when he was like 15 years old. He was like 18 years younger than Elizabeth. She was in her mid-40s, and he was in his mid-20s by the time they finally got together. He wrote Elizabeth many love letters during that last few years of their courtship. He secretly snuck into England twice to visit her without, without passports, without the permission of the King of France. Elizabeth daily would visit his chambers improperly chaperoned. So she was alone with him in his bedchamber from time to time during the times that he would sneak into England. And according to Martin Hume, whose wonderful book uh, I highly recommend, The Courtships of Queen Elizabeth and Her Suitors, uh, to, to, after her marriage, it's easily available. You can get a reprint edition for $15. It's fabulous uh, commentaries on the, on the courtships of Queen Elizabeth, and particularly the Alençon affair. Uh, all these things are really pointing in this direction. The Queen's passion and vanity were overmastering her judgment. The, 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 the Lester and Walsingham and Philip Sidney, they were all opposed to the Alençon match, whereas the Earl of Sussex and William Cecil and presumably the Earl of Oxford were in favor of the Alençon match. They were basically triangulating. She was never going to marry him. She was trying to keep the French from having an alliance with the Spanish, and they would have a unified uh, force against England at that time. In 1579, Alençon sent his ambassador, Jean Simier, to negotiate terms of the marriage treaty. At one time, there were 400 ambassadors in 1581 that came over for these negotiations. It was a huge deal. Al Simier was the most choice courter, exquisitely skilled in love toys, pleasant conceits, court dalliances. She was called, Elizabeth called him her ape, Simier, ape. He was accused by the Earl of Leicester of using love potions, and Leicester tried to have him assassinated twice, unsuccessfully. He actually, Simier outed Lester for his marriage to Lettuce Nolis, which then resulted in Lester's being put in house arrest. So he was critical right in the middle of this whole, you know, melodrama going on. It was like a soap opera in the court of England. Queen Elizabeth, what she had become, this is, this is what uh, Hume says, she had become more beautiful and bonny than she was 15 years ago. So she had these two little Frenchmen sneaking in and out of England, giving her love potions, and she was visiting them unchaperoned in their bedchambers. I think we have a story here that, that's worth doing. Alençon, known as Monsieur, when he finally left at the end of the negotiations, when it was obvious that, the, that Elizabeth would not marry a Catholic, uh, she wrote this very ambivalent poem, On Monsieur's Departure, I grieve and dare not show my discontent. I do yet dare to not say I ever meant. I seem stark mute, but in really do prate. I am and not, I freeze and yet I... So far, so ambivalent. It goes on and on and on. You can go on Monsieur's departure. You can just Google that and you see this most incredible ambivalent uh, thing. And she received love letters from Simier also, which only recently were decoded. They were sent in, in, in a cipher of some type. You know, so these guys were really having some fun behind the dais in, in the queen's bedroom. Now, on his death in 1584, Elizabeth grieved publicly for three weeks. She wore black for six months and referred to herself as a widow. That's how close he came to marrying her. Then at the age of 29, this is what Mar Hume says, this is it. His passing bell rang down the curtain upon the longest and most eventful comedy in the history of England. Now, do you think Shakespeare, if he knew about this, if he was on the inside of this, would have 10 years later taken the risk of writing a play about this? I think so. 
This is what the Earl of Oxford had to put up. Now, during this time, the Earl of Oxford was in exile from court. This is after he had impregnated Anne Vavasard and had the legitimate child and was banished from court for several years. All this was going on some of the time while he was no longer uh, available in court. Um, Stephen Budiansky, a modern uh, uh, historian writing about uh, Francis Walsingham, says this, their courtship became simply a farce, a bit of political theater that dragged on three scenes too long, a joke even to the queen, as she admitted in, in moments of privacy and candor. Now, I want to tie, in the last 15 minutes of my talk here, how Bottom and Alan are tied together. Well, at the beginning of the play, when the blue mechanicals are getting cast in the roles, Bottom says, I could play Ericles rarely, or a part to tear a can in to make all split. So he, he, he claims that he could play Hercules. Well, Hercule de Valois, okay? There's, there's the name. Bottom repeatedly addresses each of the fairies as Monsieur, which was his appellation, Alan Sun's appellation. Bottom repeat, repeatedly asks for the honey bag, the honey bag. Now, now, asses don't eat honey. Why does he want a honey bag? Maybe that's a little thing about money bag. Because Alan Sun received huge support from Elizabeth for the campaign in the Low Countries, 350,000 pounds altogether. Oxfordians are impressed with the fact that the Earl got 1,000 pounds a year for 18 years. Alan Sands, uh, you know, contributions dwarf that substantially. Now, there's one more thing about the face and the beard that Alan said. Now, he had pockmarks because he had smallpox, and so did Elizabeth, actually. So there may have been some, some, uni, 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 you know, some connection because they both had survived smallpox. Bottom says, he's talking about how he'll play his role as Pyramus. I will discharge it in either your straw colored beard, your orange and tawny beard, your purple and grain beard, or your French crown colored beard, your perfect yellow. Quint says, some of your French crowns have no hair at all, and then you play them barefaced. Well, this is a loaded uh, discourse between these two. French crown actually is a joke alluding to the loss of hair that you get when you have secondary and tertiary syphilis, the French pox. It's also called the French pox. So it's a pun on French royalty, French crown, French money, and the baldness from syphilis. Now, Alan Sound was slatterously rumored to have had gone bald from syphilis in the gaping golf pamphlet that cost John Stubbs his right hand. Alan Sun's beard was discussed in state papers as well. Um, there's a satiric comment well, when, when Francis Flute, okay, Francois, Francis, another character in the Rude Mechanicals that has Alan Sun's name. Pyramus is a sweet faced man, is what Quince tells, tells uh, uh, Francis Flute, who, who doesn't want to play a girl. He says, but the talk of Elizabeth's marriage to Alan Sun was drawn out with a thousand banalities as to the possibility of secret meetings between the lovers than the depth and number of pock holes in the suitor's face from the scarring from the smallpox. Finally, the last illusion I'm going to kind of tag into you with is this one. This is, this is the most potent one of all. When Oberon's talking about what he's going to do with the love potion, he says, I'll watch Titania when she is asleep and drop the liquor into her eyes. The next thing, then she is waking, looks upon, be it a lion, bear, or wolf, or bull, on meddling monkey or on busy ape. So he's doubling down on that simian imagery. She shall pursue it with the soul of love. Well, the meddling monkey and the busy ape could be allusion to the simia, her ape, okay? And the meddling monkey could be Alanson because his, his brother, Henry V, referred to him as the petit magot, the little monkey. So both of these French suitors were known as monkeys. So that's probably where that double image of the meddling monkey or the busy ape comes from. So, so that we have lots of associations. So what are the associations of the cast? What is our allegorical cast? Queen Elizabeth as Titania, Hercule Valois is represented by Bottom and Pyramus. Francois, the same person as Francis Flute and Thisbe. Ambassador de Canze, who came early in the negotiation as Peter Quince, same route. Du Bex was Alençon's secretary, who came with him on both occasions. Bex meaning beak, snout, okay? The Earl of Leicester was Elizabeth's Robin. Perhaps he represents Robin Starveling, who has to play Moonshine in the uh, allegory of uh, Pyramus and Thisbe. And Ambassador Mo de Fenelon, who was also part of the negotiating team as, as the fairy Ma, or Mo. Roger Strittmaner's article in the Oxford in 2006 is what really set me onto this case. He says this, and I'm just going to quickly go through this. Topical evidence suggests that an author whose preoccupations included a closely veiled comic commentary on one of the most explosive issues of the reign, the intersection of the private life and courtships of Elizabeth I and the matters of public policy and authority. So often do the queen, her courtship, and the matter of succession appear in the critical literature of A Midsummer Night's Dream that it is difficult to avoid concluding that the play constitutes on one level a sly commentary on the sexual politics of the Elizabethan era. And I think uh, the case is made for that. Bottom Thou Art Translated is a 1974 
a book published in Amsterdam, of all places, by Marion Taylor. It's in your syllabus. If you can get a hold of that, this tells you the whole story. Not only was Shakespeare writing about this, but so were Spencer and Sidney and other writers. Uh, Mother Hubbard's Tale by Spencer is, is, is all about Simier and, 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 and Ellen Son. It's a wonderful discourse, bottomed out, translated. Finally, the Earl of Oxford did have a connection to the Duke of Alençon. He did meet him in court during the coronation of King Henry III, and he was urged by Henry Howard, his cousin, to run to Alençon and beg him for mercy at the time that Anne Bavisar's pregnancy was revealed and she delivered a baby and uh, she was the maid of honor that, uh, that had, the royal had, had uh, uh, Oxford's bastard son, um, Edward Vere. So they had some, some connection. And it's funny that, that you mention, that you think about this because the Earl of Oxford refused twice to dance before the 400 French ambassadors that came over in 1581 for the negotiations. And it's very interesting that Theseus says, we won't have any dancing when Bottom offers to do a Bergamask dance at the, at the end of Midsummer Night's Dream. So Theseus, no, no, we won't have no dancing. And Oxford says, no, no, we'll have no dancing for those French ambassadors. So maybe there's a small connection there. But I want to talk finally in the last five, 10 minutes of this talk about the politics of the Shakespeare authorship question itself. Okay? Now, we have many doubters that go back centuries, really. But really, some of the best writers and, 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 and uh, critics uh, of our you know, 20th century really have a lot to say about this. Now, Walt Whitman, he, he had some concept of this. Shakespeare was probably one of those wolfish earls. I love that quote. But Mark Twain's Is Shakespeare Dead? is a fantastic. You can get that on Google. But I highly recommend you go to the YouTube video of Keir Cutler's Is Shakespeare Dead? He performed this last year at our conference in, in, in uh, uh, Hartford, Connecticut, at the Mark Twain House. So here he was performing a Mark Twain, an adaptation of Mark Twain's satire. It was fabulous. You will very much enjoy that. Mark Twain had his finger on the pulse of this. And of course, his editors and the people who are publishing his collected works today want to disown that, that Is Shakespeare Dead chapter from his autobiography. But I think we've, we've pressed them hard on this one, and hopefully it will be included in the future of, of his uh, uh, writings. Henry James, turn of the century, says, I am haunted by the conviction that the divine William is the biggest and most successful fraud ever practiced on the patient world. And I only use one modern actor to quote him. Now, of course, we've got Derek Jacobi, Mark Rylance, uh, Jeremy Irons, uh, many others, uh, Keanu Reeves today, uh, uh, have all come down on the side that there's a problem here and there's probably somebody else wrote these works. So we have Robin Williams saying, you think a man basically with a second grade education wrote some of the greatest works of all times? I think not. Oh, what a crazy, wonderful, witty guy he was, but he understood that there was a problem here. But when you turn to those serious writers and serious scholars who want to comment on the whole question of the Shakespeare authorship question, you incur such hyperbole and such distempered responses that it's, sh it's shocking. Hilary Mantel, the author of Wolf Hall, made famous Mark Meyer Rowlands on, uh, in, in, on the, in the series that, that, was, that was performed a few years ago says this, that the authorship question is a tale of snobbery and ignorance and unhistorical assumptions, a myth about the writing life. Oh my goodness, she hasn't done the reading. Terry Teachout, Wall Street Journal theater ed uh, uh, editor and reviewer, says that we're zanies whose theory mongering has blighted the world of Shakespeare studies. Have we really blighted the world of Shakespeare studies? I think not. Peter Conrad, a reviewer, a theater reviewer for The Guardian, says Oxfordians are cranks, a reprehensible, reactionary lot, and I apologize if what I've been presenting is reprehensible or reactionary in any way. I think I'm responding actually to the historical and the literary evidence that we have at hand. Finally, the final insult comes from the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. In response to the film Anonymous, the Birthplace Trust put together a little online book called Shakespeare Bites Back. It's still available online, and here's a quote from it that is particularly stinging and in its hyperbole. Dare to suggest that snobbery is a hidden agenda of the anti-Shakespearean mo movement and you stand the risk of having your head bitten off or being made to feel you have caused offense. The Shakespeare authorship conspiracy theory is an entirely parasitic phenomenon attacking the truth in order to feed off its lifeblood. Like all conspiracy theories, it has no independent self-determining life of its own and instead attaches itself leech-like to a healthy body. And that's from the Reverend Dr. Paul Edmondson, the Director of Research and Knowledge at the Birthplace Trust, and Professor Emeritus Stanley Wells, writing just six years ago. Uh, their tune hasn't changed. I think they protest too much. 
And I have this slide to reassure you that even though we've talked about bottom and titanium this way, don't worry, girl, you're better off without those asses, okay? <laughs> Stick to the reading. Conclusions from my talk here today. Great presidents have been inspired by Shakespeare. Shakespeare's political dramas have been weaponized from the 16th to the 21st century. Elizabethan drama grew rapidly as a cultural phenomenon promoting the legitimacy of the Tudors. 16th century playwrights were often censored and imprisoned, except Shakespeare, that he enjoyed unique poetic license in satirizing members of the court, including Queen Elizabeth, and that the Shakespeare authorship challenge over the past century has become the third rail of Shakespeare and possibly even Renaissance studies. So those are my conclusions. I urge you to continue to read. Use your own judgment. Be critical. Don't listen to the likes of Terry Teachout and Hilary Mantel when they haven't done the reading. Talk to people who have done the reading. Go to the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship website. Go look at the videos that have been recorded from our previous conferences and choose some that, that may be of some interest to you. I think you need to become an independent scholar. Stephen Sable has referred to me as a scholar. I'm no scholar. I'm a motivated investigative reporter. That's what I am for you, friends. And I love being here talking to you about these subjects, and I appreciate your attendance and your attention during this long discourse that covered so many subjects that, that is a fascination, I think, to all of us uh, that are involved in this movement uh, in terms of trying to find the truth about Shakespeare, because he did have a political uh, commentaries that made that were quite satiric. And there are other members of the court, of course, who were also critiqued in, in some of the other plays of Shakespeare, which I didn't have time to get into today. But I think we've covered the basis pretty well. We've come a long way, friends, to, to try to understand um, how does Shakespeare and politics relate to each other. We can see that it can be used by both left and right-wing oriented uh, political philosophies. And yet, you know, there's still a great mystery around what the author's position was and how he wrote about political figures that were his own contemporaries. I think uh, I've covered the basis pretty well. I urge you to go do some of the reading, uh, background reading on this. I think it's fascinating material. I look forward to giving further presentations uh, on other subjects in the future. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Stephen? Wow, thank you, Earl. Wow, what a fantastic presentation. <laughs> Nobody can talk a silver streak like you, brother. Nobody, nobody. What a wonderful <laughs> opening to our symposium this evening. And uh, what a fantastic presentation. And as Earl said, if you'd like to know more, please go to ShakespeareOxfordFellowship.org. He showed you that great screen with many of the great publications. And I agree with you. You know, Earl, sometimes I have conversations with friends. You know, being a theater guy, I have a lot of actor friends and a lot of theater producer, director friends. And many of them will start expounding upon the extolling the virtues of the Stratfordian man. And I always say to them, the difference between me and them is I know everything there is to know about the Stratford man. They know nothing about the Earl of Oxford. And so it's difficult to have that conversation or that debate with them. So Earl's right, do the reading, catch up, get up to speed. And then you will have the ability to also then turn to those naysayers who are Stratfordians and say, hey, here's a book to read. Uh, catch up, and then we can have this discussion. Well, you know, Shakespeare referenced at least 200 volumes of, of, of literature, uh, classical literature, Renaissance literature, uh, uh, of the Bible, uh, all sorts of uh, sources. Uh, yet the Stratford Grammar School, we don't know what the inventory of books that were there, but most of the grammar school had but a handful of, of classical texts. Uh, you know, the, the Birthplace Trust would like us to believe that the quality of education in Stratford-upon-Avon was as good as it was at the, at the uh, elite schools like Winchester or other schools like that that like Ben Johnson went to, where there were noted scholars and, uh, and noted li libraries that supported them. Uh, Winchester and Lincoln, and there were several schools that actually taught Greek, but we can't, we can't imagine that they, there was a Greek taught at the Shakespeare, at the Gra Grammar School in Stratford-upon-Avon. But many schools had really limited availability text, and there wasn't any universal curriculum that, 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 that was there. So the, the fact is that we have no uh, evidence that Shakespeare ever owned a book. Uh, and these would have been extremely valuable, uh, worth you know today, today's dollars. A folio edition of, of the collected works of Shakespeare would be worth a thousand dollars. You know, so so really those kind of things like the Plutarch's Lives, several uh, 1,500 pages, uh, a beautiful folio edition, and Shakespeare referenced that in a number of his plays. Uh, but you know, the Earl of Oxford had a French edition of that, and we know that he was quite fluent in French, Latin, Italian, 
I, I think Greek because he went to the Greek church in in, uh, in in Venice during the year that he was in residence. I touch on a, a few of those topics in my presentation that I'll be giving tomorrow as part of our schedule for tomorrow. Right now, before we go into more about tomorrow's schedule, I'd like to bring back our illustrious president of the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship, John Hamill, who is going to come and talk to us about uh, a wonderful contribution that he has made. You know, one of the things that we'd like to tell you is we're so pleased that we're able to bring this symposium to you free of charge. And those of you who pre-registered, you were able to receive some extra um, some extra aspects to the symposium to help you enjoy the symposium through the next two days. You received the schedule, the, um, the syllabus, the extra reading materials and those types of things. Those of you who did not register, you'll be able to access those through our website. And we're so pleased that we were able to bring all of that to you at no charge, thanks to the generous and the, the great generosity of our many donors, many of whom had pre-registered for our annual conference. And when we contacted you all and asked you about the cancellation of the conference and this idea to present this symposium, many of you were so generous and gracious as to contribute your pre-registration fees to the organization to help us support this symposium in honor of the memory of our immediate past president, Tom Renier. And as John pointed out earlier this evening, we do dedicate this symposium to the memory of Tom. Tom's contributions to the organization cannot be expressed in just one weekend of symposiums. And uh, his is still the most viewed presentation on our YouTube channel today. And I, can, I believe that that record will never be broken. Um, and so Tom, wherever you are, we hope you're looking down upon us and we hope that you're pleased with what we've been able to accomplish. So we want to thank everybody who contributed so wonderfully to make this happen. John's going to come and talk to us about a couple of other things and how you can also continue to contribute to see this research and to see our outreach efforts continue. John, welcome back. Thank you, thank you. Great talk, Earl. Uh, and I want, before I talk, bring up donations, which are jingling money for you guys, uh, I want to mention again books. Earl talked about books that you should get, and this is a ish, book, books that have just been published by Vere's Publishing, and it's uh, the, the place of Edward de Vere, Merchant of Venice, Miss Summer Night Stream, and they're doing, they're doing all the plays, they'll be doing all the poems and all the sonnets, and they, inside you'll find a biography of Oxford. Uh, May I? Yeah. And, uh, and uh, the, 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 the books will not have, don't have any notations, it's just a play. It's just a play, but they, they have, an, they have a, a like biography of Oxford, and, and, and it shows that the plays were written by Edward de Vere. So you should take a look at these. The first time that's been done. Uh, so this is a great a, a brand great, new editions great of the entire Shakespearean canon, credited to the real author Edward de Vere. What a magnificent series! And as you said, Verus Publishing. Verus Publishing. And it says here VerusBooks.com. V-E-R-U-S Books.com. VerusBooks.com. If you'd like to purchase copies of the works of Shakespeare credited to the actual author without the pseudonym. And you can order them through Amazon or directly with a publisher, Veras.com. Either way, you can get the books. Just awesome. Look. What else do you have there? You seem to have a bunch of things <laughs> in your hands there. How about I help you? <laughs> the other thing is, well, again, I want to thank uh, everybody who's contributed. As Stephen said, a lot of people have contributed to this conference. And so we're trying to, this weekend, to uh, get $10,000 worth of donations in memory of Tom and also to maintain this symposium. This symposium is brought to you free of charge. You guys don't have to pay to go to a conference, a hotel, the airfare, et cetera. You can watch it from the convenience of your home. But we, we have to spend money here to set up the, you know, get the people to set up the, the equipment. So but again, we're doing this free of charge for you guys. A lot of people have already contributed, as Stephen said and Nero has said, to this conference. So the $10,000, like a quarter has been donated already. And I'm gonna contribute $1,000 in addition to that 
to, to, to keep the wow. people going. So, uh, so we, we were at more than 2,500 before we even started today. Yeah. Now, John, you just added $1,000 to that. That puts us at $3,500. Yeah. So we'd like you at home, if you would like to, to see us continue these efforts and to continue the mission of bringing the truth to the world, please go to ShakespeareOxfordFellowship.org, ShakespeareOxfordFellowship.org. <laughs> you can click right on the donate button and make a contribution. Yeah. And we'll announce how much we, we, we collect tomorrow by three o'clock. And to also to encourage people to donate, I'm gonna have Ben August to come over here, our host, because he has a special offer to encourage people to donate, a very unique offer, which, I think, which will encourage you to do so. Go ahead, Ben. Hello, everyone. Uh, again, thank you for uh, joining us. Come on up here, Ben. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so uh, in an effort to help raise the money that we're all looking for, 10000 was mentioned. Um, I had an idea. I, I'm the one who had commissioned Paula Slater to do the uh, original bust of Shakespeare uh, in the form of Edward de Vere. And uh, I've got a, a smaller version that's done in a unique material. It's a very beautiful piece. And I thought it would be effective, perhaps, to, um, to offer this up as a gift to uh, the fellowship. And then what we're going to do is use it as an item to raise money. Um, I've got it right here. So this, this is the sculpture. Uh, it's of Edward de Vere as Shakespeare. Let's see, we get John. Can you hold the sculpture because yeah, I, I think Ben and I are that. wearing light colors, yeah. and oh. it, it, there yeah. we go. There's a better contrast. Yeah. You're wearing can a darker you, can shirt. Can you see the face because of the light? I know it's a yeah, very, it's very well done, very well done sculpture of Edward de Vere. So the idea is, uh, how do gonna, we get that? Yeah. So this is how you get it uh, for this this symposium. Uh, if you contribute or donate two hundred and fifty dollars. Uh, to our program, to the fellowship, you're going to be entered in a raffle. And uh, one lucky uh, contributor will uh, receive this. I think we're going to have a live drawing later in the tomorrow, program. Tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon. So tomorrow you'll afternoon. be able to witness it live. Uh, so for every $250 that you contribute, uh, you will get one chance to win this. We'll ship it. I'll ship it to you personally. So does John get four entries for his thousand dollar donation? Yeah, no, that will be the, uh, John's no, free. No, He's, yeah. John, John is excluded <laughs> from the it. drawing. Yeah, I don't want to think. But if you at home yeah. donate a thousand dollars, that would qualify you for four, four entries. For, for tickets for the raffle. Awesome, great clarification. Every two hundred fifty dollars is a ticket. Yeah. And also, we said if you've already contributed, let's say you've contributed one hundred and fifty already, by adding a hundred you'll get into the raffle as well, yeah. correct? So those people who already donated their previous conference registrations or contributed to the symposium, they can, if they've already contributed 250, they're already entered automatically into right. the drawing. Right. Right. But if they only contributed, say, 150, they can add 100 right now, and that will qualify them for the drawing. Yeah. Right. If they've already donated 500, they've already qualified for two right. yeah. tickets into the drawing. Is right. that correct? Right. Fantastic deal. And, and also, I think what's important for us to know is, you know, the work that the fellowship is doing, the research programs, programs like this, uh, the video contests, these are all things that these funds go toward. Tomorrow, when we announce the winners of the video contest, we'll be announcing winners. Our grand prize winner receives $1,000. Our second place winner is at 500. Yeah. And yeah. our third place winner is $250. We... We are the only organization that sponsors research into this subject, up to $20,000 a year to qualified researchers who have to apply through a rigorous process in order to receive that funding and then report back to us what they've learned and what they've discovered yeah. in this front. And that's a, a very worthwhile program that the organization has supported for years now and contributions help make that happen right. every year. In addition, tomorrow we'll also announce the winner of the Oxfordian of the Year. Uh, and that's a, uh, every year, we've been doing that for about 10, 15 years now. And the members of the group are former Oxfordian of the Year members, and they select the next member, the next member. So it's like, it's like our, our Oscar. It's <laughs> yes. like our Oscar now, winner. What is, let's and then, and then, let's and then pass to this go, over to back go, to Ben. To go back to Ben. Because I want to know what this yeah, is. Yeah, to go back to Ben's offer of the 
of the, the winner of, of the raffle tomorrow for $250 each, each, each uh, ticket. And we'll also, the winner will also receive this T-shirt, uh, which was uh, made by Julie Bianchi. And so this is part of the winner for tomorrow's raffle. We'll also get this T-shirt. And there's a quote from As You Like It. Uh, it's a very nice T-shirt. Anyway, that, they can dress up Oxford in his T-shirt if you want to. <laughs> oh, very good. Awesome. So, so go to ShakespeareOxfordFellowship.org. ShakespeareOxfordFellowship.org. There is a button you can click right on the home page to, don to donate money and to contribute. We'll be keeping track of that. We'll be making sure that everybody who qualifies gets entered into the drawing. And then tomorrow afternoon, in the, near the end of the program, at 3 p.m., I believe, yeah. is when yeah. we'll be including that in our presentations. And we will announce the winner at that time. And if $250 is too much for you, we'll accept any donation, 10 cents to, to a dollar. So <laughs> if every donation is good, don't worry, you don't have to pay $250 to help us. We accept any, any donation is helpful to us. Thank you. Thank you, John. So in our last bit of time this evening, remember we'll be wrapping up at 6 p.m. tonight, but we'll be back tomorrow at 9 a.m. to continue our symposium. We have a great schedule lined up, and I want to take a little bit of time tonight to review what we're going to be doing tomorrow. So we'll begin at 9 a.m. tomorrow as we welcome you back to our live broadcast right here from Napa, California and the August Family Vineyards. We'll uh, then move into a presentation from James Warren, who is the editor of the centenary of edition of Shakespeare Identified by J. Thomas Loney. And uh, James Warren's presentation will go from 9 10 a.m. to 9.40 a.m., and that will be about Loney's difficult task of helping to share this truth with the world. We'll then preview uh, some of our video finalists and uh, also show you some of our winners from previous years. Next, we will offer, uh, we will welcome Mark Andre Alexander to our live stream, and Mark will be talking about Stratfordian blind spots. He'll be pointing out some of the things that we find within that uh, established uh, orthodoxy that we constantly run up against, especially in the halls of academia where those long, long white bearded men say, you crazy conspiracy theorists, how dare you question the authorship of Shakespeare. Um, we will continue on at 10.35 with our Oxfordian of the Year from 2019, Cheryl Egan Donovan, who uh, will be presenting a fascinating talk called Shakespeare Auteur, and it is subtitled Creating Authentic Characters for the Screen. Now, some of you who are regular listeners to the podcast series remember that I welcomed Cheryl to the podcast to discuss this presentation that she is going to give us tomorrow. And um, she's also working on a book to that extent with regards to that. And it's based um, partially on classes that she offers to her students at the university where she teaches. Uh, after that, 11.05, we'll offer a presentation from Sky Gilbert, PhD, Shakespeare Beyond Science, When Poetry Was the World, also, avid listeners of the podcast series will remember that I invited Sky on, and we had a great conversation about his book, which is now out, and uh, we'll be able to show you a copy of that, and um, he'll be giving his presentation, sort of a recap of what's inside the book and why it's such an important uh, Oxfordian publication that just came out this year, and if you don't have a copy of that one for your Oxfordian library, you can also find that one at Amazon.com, or uh, if you Google... Shakespeare Beyond Science, it'll pop up and you'll find a variety of ways to get it. So don't forget to tune into that one at 11.05. After Sky's presentation, it'll be me, yours truly, and I'm going to be presenting a presentation on the mentors to genius. And I'll be presenting a comparison between Mozart, Einstein, and Edward de Vere and the way that their genius was fostered by the mentors in their lives. And uh, I hope you'll be fascinated by that. If not, you can email me and give me your critique. That's fine. Um, but that will be our just before lunch presentation. We will take a lunch break from noon to 1 p.m. And that's when the channel will go dark, as it were. 
uh, we might offer you a little bit of classical music, perhaps some Mozart to listen to right after our presentation. Um, and you'll all be able to take a nice break for lunch. We'll be taking a break for lunch here in Napa as well. And then we will return at 1 o'clock. And at 1.05, Catherine Children will be here. And Catherine will be presenting Lord Prospero in the Tempest and Lord Prospero Visconti, a fascinating discussion about the origins of the character Prospero and what Catherine's research has discovered with regards to the influences that led to the, that important character in The Tempest. Um, after that, we will have a live broadcast of a episode of Don't Quill the Messenger. And that's when Dr. Earl Shoreman will return and he will join me. And we will be discussing Ramon Jimenez's great research uh, into Shakespeare's apprenticeship and, uh, as Ramon loves to put it, the 10 eyewitnesses who saw nothing. And we'll talk about some of the people in the time of Shakespeare who should have known that Stratford was Shakespeare if he was, but never mentioned it. Uh, and that's a fascinating conversation as well that Earl and I will be having together right here live as a, a version of don't Quill the Messenger live, right here before your very eyes. And you'll see how we record those episodes. Um, at 2.40, we will welcome Brian Wildenthal. And we'll be talking about early authorship doubts, the Oxfordian connections. Brian has also produced a wonderful book. And his book is about all of the early references and allusions that occurred all the way dating back to the origins of the Shakespearean canon where the writers and critics of the time were mentioning already hints and little innuendos about the fact that Shakespeare was a pseudonym, that Shakespeare was a somebody of renown, somebody of nobility, who was writing under this fake name in order to hide their identity. And as we mentioned earlier at the beginning of the program, this does date back 400 or more years um, to when people knew the truth and just couldn't say so. Then our, one of our keynote presentations of the symposium, we will have a presentation by Donald Ostrowski, and uh, he's also a PhD lecturer in history from Harvard University's Extension School, and um, Ostrowski has recently written a book and published it, and it's... Um, Call, his talk will be called Toward an Epistemology of Attribution, a Comparison of the Shakespeare and Kerbsky Authorship Controversies. And Don's book is all about all of the different authorship controversies that have occurred throughout history and the different pseudonyms and the different fake fake authors and fake names that have occurred and the even his, his book even dates all the way back to the Bible as far as the mysteries behind who actually wrote what. And so we'll have that great presentation for you tomorrow a little after 3 p.m. Um, at 4 o'clock, a little after 4 o'clock, that's when we will announce our video contest winners. I hope you all had a chance to view all 10 of our finalists from this year. Every year of this contest, it's been the fourth year now that we've had the video contest, and each year the number of entries and the quality of the entries continues to amaze those of us who are on the judging panel. And we had a difficult time this year narrowing it down to 10 finalists. We put those 10 finalists up on our website and on our YouTube channel for all of you viewers to view and to um, vote on, and all the voting took place from the public, and we'll announce those winners tomorrow. Uh, I know I had my favorites, and I was able to cast my single vote. It was single vote per IP address, so you can just go in and click on your favorite 18 times or get your mother to vote for you 18 times. That's not how it worked. And um, so we'll be excited to announce those winners and award those cash prizes to the winners of our video contest tomorrow. Then um, we will have a wonderful video that has been compiled by Brian Wildenthal and Jennifer Newton that pays a fantastic tribute to Tom Renier. 
And as you've heard us mention this evening, and as you'll hear us mention again throughout the day tomorrow, uh, we all miss Tom. We wish we, he were a part of this uh, here this weekend. And so we've made it a point to make him a part of it as much as we can. And tomorrow afternoon, we have a great video compilation of some of Tom's greatest hits from his many YouTube video presentations from past conferences and sort of our collective fellowship tribute to our immediate past president and his contributions to our organization. And uh, it'd be, it's important to note that when we lost Tom, there were at least five different people who had to take on the duties that that one man used to do for our organization. And uh, it took all five of us to divide them up and figure out a way to keep those things going. So Tom is sorely missed, and you'll see a great tribute to him tomorrow afternoon near the end of our broadcast. And then we will conclude after that with some final comments uh, from yours truly, your Master of Ceremonies for the Week, and our wonderful host, Ben August, and of course our illustrious President, John Hamill. We hope that you have enjoyed this evening's introductory broadcast. We hope that you will join us all day tomorrow from 9 to 5. If you can't be with us the entire day, we hope you'll look over the schedule and choose your favorites. And we will remind you that each of the presentations will eventually be available on our YouTube channel in case you miss one or in case you get pulled away from the screen for a little while. Or, even better, if there's one that you need to view again and maybe jot down some notes as to what you want to research or what you want to look into um, or what you want to use as arrows in your quiver uh, the next time you have this debate with a friend or family member who says, what do you mean Shakespeare didn't write Shakespeare? And with that, I'll remind you that we never said Shakespeare didn't write Shakespeare. Of course Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare. What we say is that Shakespeare was not a man from Stratford, the son of a glove maker, but the noble genius that was Edward de Vere. And uh, as I said, uh, tomorrow in my presentation, we'll talk a little bit about how important it is to mine the treasures of genius and how that happens uh, across the history of some of the greatest genius minds of the last uh, four centuries. Thank you for joining us again. We're so privileged to uh, be welcomed into your homes, offices, or wherever you have been screening us this evening. And we look forward to seeing you back tomorrow morning, 9 a.m., right here on the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship YouTube channel. Good night.